podcast. Hello there, Jeff Manchester, Manchester Music. Welcome. This is the resumption uh, of, if that's a word, of the vodcast series, which is a video podcast kind of thing that I do where I answer questions that you've submitted about audio production, mixing, mastering, repair, life, whatever you think I might have an answer to. And I do it while drinking vodka, um, which is off camera right now, but you know, we're imbibing. If you want to reach out to me and ask me a question and have it featured in this series, you can do so by writing me at vodcastpodcaster at gmail.com. Uh, I'm at Twitter at Jeff Manch. I'm on Instagram, Manchester Music Official. You can leave a comment on YouTube videos. I'll go through and check them out. All the information to contact me is in the description, by the way. And eventually I'll make a video like this and get back to you. In some cases, the questions that I'm going to be answering have already been answered in comments or, or YouTube or uh, Gmail, but I know that not all of you spend your lives on the internet as much as I do. So I'm circling back and answering them here today uh, for you in this episode of the podcast. So let's just jump right into it. Okay. The first question that I got comes from uh, Ruben who asks, um, on the video that I did of the head monitors, uh, review, he goes, what song is playing? I think he means the one at the very beginning of that episode. I like the expressive strings. Well, the song Ruben is called Equinox and it's by an artist called Bad Snacks. I'm lucky enough to have actually met Bad Snacks. Um, she's really cool. She has a YouTube channel, which you should check out. And I got the song. I should just say for any YouTube content creators out there, I got it from the bank, the library of songs that you get as a creator when you sign into YouTube and go on the back end, the royalty free, whatever songs. Um, and I was really surprised because I know Bad Snacks. Um, her music isn't like stuff I would listen to or like and whatever, but it's good like YouTube background music. 90% of the stuff that YouTube has for you to download is really, really bad. Like it's really, really bad. So when I saw her name there, I was like, oh my goodness, really? Because it's just so head and shoulders above what is available to creators. Um, so that's why her music and that song always feature, it might be in the video right now, um, always feature on the videos that I make. So Bad Snacks, go check her out. She's awesome, talented, cool, blah, blah, blah. So that's who that person is. And that's what the name of the song is, Ruben. Okay, um, Dana asks, hi, Dear Mr. Manchester, best greetings. I'm asking about selecting a good microphone for recording flamenco or classical guitar, they say. As you know, both of them have nylon strings. However, there is the LCT microphones, if you wish, like the LCT 140 Air, which there is many videos on YouTube about. It is which tested with the acoustic guitar and not, okay, so tested with acoustic guitar, not the nylon strings that he's talking about. Nylon or vinyl? I always thought classical guitars were vinyl strings. I don't know. As you know, the acoustic guitar has a bright tone because of the steel strings. So I hope you can show me the best one without hesitating, the best one to buy without hesitating. So honestly, so first of all, I think it's really important that, that people are thinking about the best microphone to match or pair with the sound source because that's kind of what you should do. You shouldn't just get one microphone and then that's the mic for everything and anything. Um, because different people and sound sources um, suit really well with different kind of microphones. You might buy like a U87 or something and think, oh, this is the only microphone I ever need. Well, you get someone in that's super bright and sibilant and suddenly they're amplified by a bright sibilant condenser microphone from Neumann and it's just not going to work. They need something darker. You know, it's like people with a round face need like square sunglasses or glasses and people with square faces look great with like, you know, kind of round sunglasses like John Lennon like there's there's just there's ways to pair people and things together so it's good that people are thinking about that with microphones that being said you know I think that if you're trying to get a great recording you know microphones in like the 200 to 600 dollar range now are really amazing like the ones from the brands the usual suspects the AKGs the Shures and all that stuff you could probably get a great sound out of an SM58 or 57 and no one would know no one would know that you know that microphone was used just because mics are great it's hard to find bad microphones now from the usual suspects if you go with the Lewitt line I would say that like I've only ever played with the 540 
Um, so I can't really speak to it on, on, on classical guitar. I have recorded acoustic guitar with it and it sounds wonderful, but again, you're interested in the kind of nylon string sound. I would say with a certain amount of confidence that you're probably going to get a great sound from Lewitt if you choose to go with Lewitt, um, just as you would a great sound with any, you know, microphone um, from the, the people that I mentioned. I will say though that, you know, we're lucky now that we actually have microphones that are interesting. They can change their tone uh, really easily, either through analog solution or a digital signal processing solution. So with something like the Slate, it's like VM1 or something. I don't own anything by Slate, but I know that they have this thing where you can switch out different microphones. You have one piece of hardware and then it'll kind of, you can swap out the microphones based on classic models that are in your computer and you can just swap them out and audition different ones to find the right microphone for the, the sound source, right? One thing getting back to Lewitt is that they've just released a microphone called the 1040, which can do this, but at an all analog level. So you have a controller where you can dial in the tone of the microphone so that if you have a singer who's super sibilant, well, you just shift around the tone of the microphone to have a darker sound so that it's not so sibilant. If you have someone who's very dark, you want to brighten them up, you can switch the tone of the Lewitt mic to make it brighter. Um, I, I don't own that microphone, so I'm kind of talking about it in abstract, but that microphone is also like $3,000 here in Canada. Uh, so it's expensive, probably not what you're thinking about, um, right? For your first kind of like capturing a classical guitar. I would say though that depending on where you live, I live here in Ottawa, we have Long and McQuaid, which is a, a music store. We have Steve's as well, I go to l and You can rent microphones, right? You can just go and rent them. They're not that expensive, all things considered. Rent like four or five microphones that you have your eye on for your guitar and just like, just spend the money, but this way you know what's going to sound good and then go buy that microphone, right? So just audition, try, get in your space. Your conceptions of what might sound good to you based on marketing might change when you actually have the product in the room and you're you know, testing things out. So I always advocate people who are like, what speaker should I buy? What microphone? I know it's tough. Hardware is hard to get your hands on and rent. Not everything is rentable, but microphones, depending on where you are and what store, they are easy to rent or easier to rent than other uh, pro audio gear. So hopefully something in that answer is gonna be helpful to you. And uh, that would be my answer. So Bjorn asked about my Soothe 2 review. He goes, I love your videos. Thank you, Bjorn. Um, is this good, Soothe, at removing harsh S and other high frequency consonant sounds? Or do you think a de -er would be better? So one thing the marketing of Soothe by OX Sound uh, talk a lot about is the fact that it is a very capable de -er. Um, so you've got that going for you with that tool. And I have used it as a de -er and it does excel in that kind of application. I would say if you're going to use something like Soothe just to de -s stuff, um, you're going to be incurring a pretty large CPU kind of hit on your computer because Soothe is a very, is a very powerful plugin. It requires a lot of resources to run. If you have a de -er, and I'm sure that you've got a DAW that has a digital audio workstation that has a factory tool that's just there and low latency and low CPU, use a de -er, you know what I mean? Just like use the tool that's purpose built to tackle your, your sibilance. One of the advantages of Soothe, however, is that, you know, it is very set it and forget it. You just set your bands to where the sibilance you think is and dial them in and you're good to go. A de -er requires a bit more manual um, work on your part. You, there might be like kind of a look ahead feature or a listen through feature so you can hear what's triggering the side chain of the compressor because that's what a de -er is basically just a compressor with a single band. Um, and then you kind of move things around. So Soothe is very like, just set it there, get a couple around, like listen, keep keep moving. de are a bit more manual. Um, that being said, there is a de -er. The only one that I know of that will automatically de -er vocal is Nectar from Isotope. And through its vocal assistant technology, it'll listen and then kind of target the sibilance and you can keep moving. So there's pros and cons. I would say though, that if you're using Soothe just to de -es, that's kind of like, you know, bringing a bazooka to a knife fight, you know, just use a factory de or get to know it and you're probably gonna be fine. 
Um, but if you have whatever it is, 150, 200 bucks, 300 bucks to spend on Soothe just for DSing, then yeah, go for it. <laughs> but it's a pretty elaborate tool and its use cases, while DSing is, is one of them, its use cases are probably more suited to like taking the bite out of an electric guitar or smoothing out a master or something like that. Not necessarily DSing, but it can DS and maybe it's the one that uh, you deep down want in your heart. So it's the one that you should get. So that would be my answer for you, Bjorn. Okay, so this one's from, uh, it's either like Tendu or Tendu, I don't know, T-E-N-D-O-U, who knows. Could you please tell me how they compare? So he's at, he's back to the head video, the Type 20s. How they compare to the Focal Shape 65s you tested in 2019. So the Focals versus the heads. I can't decide between those two and I don't have a store nearby to try them. I create, mix, and master EDM music if that helps. Thank you. So first off, this is what I meant by the microphone thing. Like it's hard to get gear. Um, I get it. It sucks. I'm sorry. What I would say to you though, is first off the brand, the, the genre of music should never dictate the brand of loudspeaker. If you're talking about pro audio, you're talking about PMC, Genelec, Focal, whatever, they all have great low end extension and, and resolution. So you're not going to, you know, uh, get a ton of like, no speaker set is going to like cloud the um you know the low end or whatever of your all important edm bass lines or whatever more than another they're all going to be able to kind of show you what's there um just because you might see someone in marketing using krks or whatever that's not because they are in on a secret and krks are the best ones for edm people no all of the pro audio speakers have great low end resolution and should be able to accommodate you know super super low stuff to low mids to lows so anyway just don't think about that it's tough for me to answer this question because I, you know, I need a time machine to hop back in and, and think of the, the shapes and what I thought about them. And I could watch the video and get a sense, but what I really want to do to answer your question with confidence is to have the heads next to the shapes and do a, do an AB or I, you know, would love that for you, but we can't. Um, so I guess what I would say is like Focal is a great brand. Head are a great brand too. In your heart, deep down, you might be settling on one over another. Like you might really want the shapes or you might really want the heads. They're both going to give you an accurate, clear representation of the sound and a great kind of critical listening uh, uh, tool. They're, they're both great for that. So you're probably gonna be fine depending on whichever one you go for. And in your heart, you might want mon one more than the other anyway. And when they're both that good, go for the one that deep down you want because you're probably going to be happier Right, so it's like, do I choose a Taylor guitar or a Martin guitar? They're both great guitars. And deep down, you might want a Taylor because your dad had one and his dad had one and you know what I mean? Go for the one that's gonna make you happy because the quality on both is, is really, really strong. Um, one main difference, I think, I don't know about the three-way systems on the shapes. I only know about like the Shape 65s, which are a two-way tweeter and woofer. These guys, the heads, have like a couple different variations to it for this is a three-way. One of the nice things about the heads is I can plug the ports, which give me a much more polite, articulate bass as opposed to leaving them open, which I believe they're going to be default open on the Focals no matter which one you get in that series. The bass is voluminous, it's intense, it's in your face, and it can sometimes just kind of hit you more than, um, you know, hit you in the body more than the ears when you close the ports which is why i've got these ones closed still it just gives you a tighter more i think cleaner sound of what the low end actually is and you don't get fooled into just like oh it sounds awesome because it's really hitting like you want to hear what's there you want to feel it too but you want to hear it and that's one of the cool things that i didn't even know about the heads is like closing those ports like that's a whole different bass sound for the kicks and bass lines which i, I really like um, and the thing is, if you go to the lower, I think type sevens or something, the lower kind of two-way systems, you can close those ports too on the low end with the heads. So it's not like this functionality is only available on the type, on the three ways, the type twenties and thirties. Like you can do that on the, the lower end too. So that's kind of cool. I thought it was kind of cool. Um, and something that I know, I think I know that Focal is not going to offer. So that's something you should know. So hopefully that answer helps. I'm sorry you can't check them out. You probably knew I was gonna tell you to, to go to a place where you can hear both of them. Um, but hopefully something in there that I've said is gonna be helpful. And obviously you can go to forums. 
and do a bit more digging to maybe see if other people have tried both and you can make your you know your decision based on that uh gear space is great reddit's great and you can often message people who just live on those forums and are like oh yeah let me tell you all about my you know i just can't really give you any um qualitative you know experiential data here because i don't have the two side by side so hopefully that's helpful okay so I have a question here from Eric and it's about Ozone 9. He goes, just bought Ozone 9. On my first capture flashing, on my first capture flashing and what appeared to be some type of system overload occurred. I suspect as my logic buffer preferences that are uh, set for optimal low latency that are causing this. Do you have any suggestions to manage this? So man, Ozone is a super powerful application. And the metaphor that's sometimes used around isotope, uh, at least inside, is like if you you know if you want a Ferrari, you need to pay for the gas to run it, and it's like premium, unleaded quality. You know, so it often depends on like how powerful your actual computer is. Forget about your you know your, your buffer settings. That that's certainly part of it. If you have cores, which you can spread around the you know the uh, the the work too, that helps. But like I'm finding that. Just for example, I have a nine-year-old Mac Pro. It's the trash can tower. It's got 64 gigs of RAM. It's super capable, but um, I can't really get away with running too many Ozones in it. In fact, I was recording a queue for a documentary, and I uh, was like, oh, I'll put Ozone on this before I send it out because I wanted to use the maximizer and things like that. I parked Ozone, got a good sound, and then I was like, ah, I think I might want to tinker a little bit more with this cue. So I fired up my keyboard and I started to play some MIDI through contact. And I like there was a almost a fifth, 500 millisecond, half a second delay from when I hit the note on the keyboard and when I heard it back in the speakers. And I did what you're doing. I checked the buffer and all this other stuff and I couldn't figure out what was going on. I'd forgotten that I put Ozone on, you know, and then... I got rid of ozone and the problem disappeared and I couldn't believe how intense ozone was. And I think what it comes down to is, you know, number one, I'm not on an M1 thing. My computer's 10 years old and that's just like, you know, the, the arteries harden in an old computer and that's just the way that it is. And no one, I mean, I guess I could replace um, the hard drive or I could, I don't know what I could do, but it's time for me to replace my computer. So. You know, whenever it comes to ozone and power, people have a lot of challenges. I'm not sure what the solution is for you. Figure out those settings, play with them. Maybe you've got a bunch of virtual instruments that you should just like bounce out, right? Get the MIDI and switch it over to audio. I, I don't know, but ozone is super powerful. And it's, uh, it's, it's beloved for that reason, but it also takes a lot of power to run properly. So. I don't know, man. Um, sorry to hear you going through this. I've been there too. Um, and I uh, hope you find a, a creative solution. So the next question is actually also about Ozone. So Paolo, on a video that I did called Why Is Everyone Obsessed With Ozone? He asks, the set of vibe for your track never appears. And this is because it showed up when I was using Ozone. It never appears on my version of Ozone 9 uh, Advanced. How come? So this is a, a, a point of confusion for a lot of people, and it's understandable because Isotope has tried to give you two ways to get into the products. The first way is a perpetual way. The second is a subscription way. So Ozone 9 exists in two forms. Perpetual, so you go to the website, you download it, it's yours forever. Uh, well, you have a license to use it forever. You don't actually own, you know, you don't actually own plugins, you own the license to, anyway, whatever. And then you've got the subscription version and Ozone 9 Advanced, that's perpetual. Ozone Pro is subscription. So in the Pro subscription offering, you've got, uh, it's called Music Production Suite Pro, by the way. You have Ozone, you have Nectar, you have Neutron, whatever, but they're not called, it's not like Nectar 3, Ozone, whatever. It's Nectar Pro. And that's the latest and greatest version, Ozone Pro. In an effort to kind of add a bit of value and make subscription uh, a compelling kind of entry point into the products. There are a couple of differences between the pro version and the perpetual numbered version, depending on the products. 
One big difference is that in Ozone Pro subscription, you have this tone setting thing that just doesn't exist in Ozone 9 Advanced Perpetual. Um, and for a lot of reasons, I mean, the products look the same. They're both called Ozone. They're like, well, how come mine isn't there? Well, it's because it's one thing that's only available to subscribers. That is the only difference, as far as I know, between Ozone Pro and Ozone 9. In every other way, they're just totally identical. So um, it could be that, like, by the time this video is the 30th of May or whatever, it'll change or it could change. But for now, those are the only differences. And I know that customers have been really confused about Ozone Pro and Ozone 9 Perpetual. So, uh, you know, that's unfortunate and, I, and totally understandable too. So that's why. Different products kind of one kind of extra feature. This happens too in Nectar. Nectar Pro has that same kind of tone thing. Um, whereas Nectar 3 Plus, the Perpetual version just has the kind of old style assistant. So that's why you're seeing that difference. The next question comes from Triton the Lion. He goes, hey Jeff, I just noticed you switched from the SM7B to a Lewitt. Would you recommend that more than the SM7B? Thanks and hope you're doing well. So let me just back up and say that like, I understand more than anyone how influencer marketing can influence people's decisions. You know, they see something and they think that's the thing that I need because that person has it. And that person won a Grammy or that person uh, mixed a song I love or that person wrote a, a, a score that I love. So I have to get the gear that they have. I'm not saying this is what you're saying, uh, Paolo, by the way, but when I switched from the SM7B to this guy, it's not so much like this is a superior product. That's not why. And I'm not saying that everyone should get this because this is what I have. But I understand that that's the kind of mentality. Um, people ask me all the time about my voice. Like, what do you, what's your chain, whatever. And I made videos about that. But I'll just say that like, when I started the channel, I had an AT2020 USB-I. That's like a, you know, it's a USB microphone. And then I had the SM7B and now I have this. Where I'm going with this is like gear comes into your life and sometimes you don't like it. Sometimes you don't have time to use it. And sometimes you have time to use it, you use it and you like it. And then you're using that microphone. So like some gear comes, some gear goes. Like I'm not using this because it's a statement about my tastes and how I feel about Shure, uh, the microphone company. It's just... They sent me one. Um, the team at Lewitt is super friendly and really easy to talk to. And they've just been really warm and awesome. And I think about that when I use this microphone. And like I said, I started with the USB-I, right? And that's a condenser, it's USB, but it's a condenser microphone. It's very bright. I was with the SM7 for a long time. When I got this, SM7 is dynamic, by, by the way. You know, just a big kind of magnet at the end of uh, some cables and stuff like that at the end of you know the sm7 when i got this i was like oh i kind of missed the sound of a condenser microphone so sm7 is awesome it's great um there are a couple of things you should know when and people don't know when they get it and that's that, like you need another cable you need another xlr cable you need something that's going to boost the body of the audio in the form of a cloud lifter or i have um a dynamite stick from se or whatever they're called um, you know, whereas with a condenser, you just need one cable going into an audio interface and some phantom power, obviously. So there's, you know, there's, there's, there's different, there's advantages to both or whatever, but, um, please don't think that this is some kind of like, you know, like it, it just, you get gear, you like it, and then you get something else and you're like, oh, that's kind of cool. So that's kind of where we are. Like I got this, it's kind of cool. I'll, I'll be honest, I, I did reach out to Shure about a couple of the videos I wanted to make. Like I had the SM7B and when their USB microphone came out, I gave them my SM7 video, which has gotten a lot of views and I'm very grateful. I was like, hey, I, I, I wanna do a shootout or whatever. Like, what do you think? Can you maybe send me a USB mic? And they never, they never even responded to the email. So I bought one anyway and I did the video and, and whatever. So like. When I think about that experience, reaching out to their team and everything, and I feel like Lewitt's kind of like 
you know, they're friends at this point. And so it's it's just a, a weird thing. I'm like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll use the, yeah, I have good associations with this microphone and this brand. And I'm really interested in what's coming out next. And it's almost like when you, I don't know if you guys have ever done this, like you go to a brewery, okay? And you're not a big fan of the, or whatever, you go to anywhere, like, you know, that sells Coke or something, Coca-Cola. Not a big Coke guy, not a big, you know, Carlsberg. And then you guy, you go to the brewery and you learn about it and you meet the people there and you drink it and you're like, oh my God. And then you go to a bar and you're like, oh, I'll have a Carlsberg. Like, that's kind of what happened. I just, they reached out. I was like forced to kind of take a look at this company and then try the microphone. And now I have this really positive association with it. And I like the way that it sounds. And I like the way that it, um, mostly I like the way that it looks. I still have issues with the green logo, but whatever. And here we are. So that that's all I wanted to say about that. Um, really long answer, but go for gear that works with what you have and, and try to use stuff that develops your own personal taste. So much of our critical thought, we just outsource to other people because we think like, oh, that's what I have to have. I'm not a pro mixer yet, but once I have that, I will be, or I'm not a great guitar player yet, but once I have that guitar, I will be. If you can do a little bit of like your own trial and error and develop your own kind of ears and stuff like that, um, obviously reference forums and reference magazines and reference reviews from trusted sources. But if you can do your own work and kind of just trust your gut, um, I just think you're better for it in the end. So that's my long winded answer to your question about Lewitt versus Shore. Uh, next question, Orly. Orly asks, um, this was also on the head video, I think. Because with the emergence of the new Atom A series, the A7Vs appear to be the upgrade to the A7X. It's probably too early to judge the differences, but at a glance from the Atom site, the new A series have a calibration method uh, via either net and room settings looks more uh, thought through. Your thoughts? So um, I love Atom. Uh, I tried the S3Vs. Uh, I was... Um, enamored with them. They're incredible loudspeakers. As you know, I tried the A7Xs and I did not have a positive experience with the A7Xs. I've done a little bit of research to figure out what's going on with the new A-series because I was really curious, like, are the tweeters coming from the A7s? Because I don't want them. Um, and what I was told was they're actually from the S, you know, 3V or SH, uh, there's all these letters, like they're f the tweeters from that system. And I can see that you can also change the orientation, which is kind of cool and stuff. And they have the stuff that you mentioned about like room correction, all that kind of built in. So I'm curious, um, I'll be honest, and I know they're not watching. I don't know if Adam wants to send me anything after the A7X review. They seem really cool and I love them. And people ask me about Adam all the time, but Sometimes you make a video and you just kind of give your own, like that's the thing is like they send stuff to you and not Adam, but like companies send things to you when you have a subscriber base because they want you to help sell their products, right? I am marketing for them and they, and they want to know like, what are your thoughts? And then you tell them what you think, <laughs> tell your audience and then like, they don't want to talk to you anymore. Not necessarily the case with Adam. I just haven't reached out to them in a long time, but it's happened with other companies where I like, a, you know, like, cool, this didn't work out. And that's fine. So, you know, I don't know if Adam wants to send me anything. Um, uh, but it'd be cool if he did, because I'd love to check him out. And you're not the first person that's asked me about him. And like I said, I had very positive experiences with the S3, whatever they're called, S3, S3Vs. It's on my channel. It was a while ago. Um, so I think that'll do it for this episode of the podcast. Thank you all for watching. If you have a question vodcast podcaster at gmail.com manchester music official at jeff manch on twitter manchester music that's instagram leave a comment on youtube i read them all i react to them either with a like or a comment or whatever yeah and i'll see you in the next one bye